So worrying, they say, is a form of prayer. Ooh, and for me, is it? yeah, because like whatever you're, so I'm not religious. So mm. when I heard that, I was like, what is prayer? I'm not going to sit down and ask God for my worries. Prayer is manifest. It's manifesting, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Prayer is when you think of something focused, put your energy into it and you, you really call it in. And so when you're worrying heaps, you're doing that exact same process. I think we need to take a step back from the words and look at the process. Think about something a lot, put a lot of emotion and energy behind it, it manifests in reality. Think about a good thing a lot, put a lot of good energy into it, it manifests in reality. Think about a bad thing a lot, sorry microphone, put a lot of bad energy into that, it manifests in the world. So the thing you're thinking about is not as important as the mechanism that like the process you're going through. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Yarning with Yana. And today we have Kelly Vanyai. Vanyai. Vanyai? How do I Van- say that? Van. Yay. Vanyai. 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 <laughs> um, all right, I'll give a quick uh, brief rundown. So I first met Kelly at the Baby Summit in Atlanta. That was, I think it was 2016. Um, and you were on stage, pardon? It was something like that. Yeah, I think it was 2016. There was a few different baby summits, but I'm pretty sure that Atlanta one was in 2016. And you were on stage at that time, so previous photographer, Mm -hmm. and you were on stage um, preaching the word of how to (laughs) create an amazing customer experience for clients. Yes, customers. Um, Incredible, incredible woman on stage and feature. And so since that day, you have branched out, not just with photographers, Mm -hmm. um, but everyone. Um, Now I've just told you who you are. (laughs) You you did a good job. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) why don't you tell us who you are? (laughs) I went through this stage where I would just throw people under the bus and go, who are you? And I, I, I could see their faces terrified of what I just did to them. So... Uh, I didn't want to throw you under the bus, so oh, I that's just, good. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> because it's so hard to define who you are when somebody asks that. <laughs> How do we define ourselves? Is it is it what we do or who we are? I'm just going to get straight into this. Wow, that's a good one. Well, it's actually if you're talking about the outcome, then who we're being, so who we are, is what creates our reality. Who we think we are is our identity that gets in the way of us living our best life most of the time. Yeah. So a lot of people speak about themselves as their identity, but that's just a conglomeration of rules and stories that you've told yourself over your life of who you are. But it's who you're being inside that that's the most important. So if you're being... um, like if you're a victim of your identity, if, if who you are is a, like, I'm this way because all these people did stuff to me, then you're going to be in one particular state of being compared to empowered because of the life you've been through. And so that being state of, are you in gratitude or are you in like remorse or regret or resentment has a big impact on the type of life that you manifest for yourself in just the everyday type of situations you come across. So it's an action. Is being. it an action? Being is being action. Is it, it action is. orientated or it's, it, it is feeling? Yeah, cause it's, so. mm, yeah, it's all of that. Like it, you have to take the action to decide who you want to be and then feel the feeling of that being state. So if you had asked me, let me give you an example as I introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, sorry. <laughs> Do that at the same time. So if you'd asked me who I was 20 years ago, I was somebody who was in a state of being angry and being resentful at the world because of my upbringing. And I had all these stories about who my mother was and how that affected me and who I was locked into being because of that. But that was all identity based of who I thought I was. Now, if you ask me, I am so focused on being grateful every day that whenever something happens, I step into that gratitude, I feel it inside me, and then I project it out to the world around me. So now I feel like I'm somebody who who sees the best in everything and is always looking for a way to make life better compared to who I used to be with somebody who was always looking for why it was somebody else's fault of why I felt that way. Mm. And so 
I feel very different based on those two fundamental different ways that I look at life, if that makes sense at all. Yeah. Taking responsibility for taking responsibility. Is it taking responsibility? Yeah. Absolutely. When, when spiritual people talk about taking responsibility, that's what it means. It's, it's understanding and recognizing that what happened happened and the story that you tell about it is now the most important factor in it because you can tell yourself that you're a victim about it or you can be proud of who you are because of it and see how much in your life wouldn't have happened if you hadn't learned how to be resilient, if you hadn't learned that you were strong, if you hadn't learned who you didn't want to be through whatever trauma you went through. There's so many gifts that our adversity gives us. And when we can be in a state of looking at adversity as a, as a way to step into a better life, then we can be grateful for it as it happens rather than be feeling like that victim, that leaf on the, on the wind or the leaf being tossed around on an ocean wave. We can become the surfer of the wave and learn how to like go with the flow in life. Mm. Life is happening to me rather than me for me instead of for me. me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. To me. <laughs> yes. Um, all right. We just got wait. We just went straight and we went deep. Too many there. tabs Too, open up. Yana. Yeah. I told you, you asked me a Don't question worry, and man. like 20 tabs open. If, if you're looking for some sort of structure, you ain't going to get it here. Right. Um, bing, 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 bing. But I do have some notes. So I am okay. going to try and bring us back to this, but tell me a little bit. So, um, so, so, we, you know, most of our listeners are photographers, although they are everybody as well. What made you go from the transition of teaching people about customer experience into teaching people to love themselves, essentially? It was that through teaching about customer experience, I realized the biggest block for most people was their own self-worth. That is I that s- people who, so is that customers or is that photographers or? Both. both. Oh, okay. Yeah, both. So to give a good customer experience from the customer's perspective, the, the photographer needs to understand that the customer is coming with a whole bunch of insecurities and, and limiting identity, identifying uh, issues or, or problems that they see about themselves. All of us? Majority. Mm-hmm. And the ones who are, and um, it's so varied because if you think about those people who are like really confident and want to come and have a photo shoot, they're the peacocks, they love being in front of the camera and all of that, they've still got their own um, sense of something they're proving to themselves. Mm. And so everybody comes with some preconceived notion of who they are. And when we can get ourselves out of the way, and instead of looking for, did I do a good job? Did this person buy my photos as a sign of me being a worthy photographer? And we remove ourselves from that way of thinking and just think that every single person is coming with their own story inside their their head about who they are. And sometimes that's good. And most of the time that's, I'm not good enough. I just want the kids in the photos because I don't look attractive anymore. Um, My husband doesn't really love me. So when we're in front of the camera, it's going to be weird to get these lovey smoochy kissy photos because he doesn't do that at home. Like the number of stories that I heard from people when I was booking them in for their photo shoot used to really like inspire me to help them break through that way of seeing their life and seeing by the end of the experience with me and through their photographs that actually the things they loved about each other are there. They've just been taking them for granted Mm. and about themselves as well. They didn't realize what was lovable about themselves as a client. And so getting them to see themselves through the eyes of their partner, the eyes of their children, themselves through my eyes, where I see the best in them, that brought out a, a level of confidence and love for themselves that I just, I loved so much And to get photographers to emulate that same experience that I was doing every day in the studio, I realized I had to get the photographers to step out of their own shoes and into the shoes of the client. And to do that, for people to do that, we have to put aside how we feel about everything and the model of the world that we're so ingrained in believing is real and put that aside, which isn't an easy thing to do, and look at life with fresh eyes from a completely fresh perspective. And to do that, there are so many internal unconscious programs that can get in the way that to make a long lasting 
um, outcome for that kind of transformation, I realized I needed to be a hypnotherapist to go in to the unconscious mind and tweak those codes so that the thing that you really wanted to do, which was give a great customer experience, was easy rather than challenging and constantly putting yourself out of the way. It was just, okay, I'm in giving all of my attention to my client zone and finding that easy and getting a good result because you were there. So it flowed from that. Right. Now, I understand the subconscious mind and how that mm-hmm messes with everything <laughs> but for our listeners can listeners can you give us a, a brief rundown of, of of what what the all about the unconscious mm-hmm. mind and and how that blocks us or gets in our way or helps us yeah it can be both good mm. so your unconscious mind is kind of like a computer that's operating in the background you've got your your front interface whether you're a windows or pc person And that's, you know, the stuff you see on your screen is your conscious mind. It's the things that you're currently aware of. And you can't have too much on the screen at any one time because our minds can't consciously stay focused with that many things at once. So there are billions of pieces of information bombarding us at any one time. But our unconscious mind, it it operates behind the scenes by sorting and deleting and sending some stuff through to our conscious mind and the rest, it kind of just does by itself behind the scenes. And it's been picking up programs, creating programs since birth or sometimes even in the womb. A lot of people that I work Mm. with go all the way back into the womb and some of the feelings that they've been holding for their whole life have actually been their mum's worries that they, you know, about, am I going to be a good mother and and stuff like that. And the baby's even taken, am I going to be capable kind of belief systems Mm. it's really interesting um but so we're constantly looking for how is it here how do i interact with what's going on around me and so as we're looking for that our brain is looking for what are the rules of engagement and once it's done something enough and it thinks it knows it stores that program as a okay we're done here this is what we operate every time you go near this feeling we run this sequence of actions and emotions and words and that's what we do in that situation so is that the identity that you're talking about so is this what develops the stories is this what develops that internal dialogue as well yeah so the it's interesting it's all interlinked because your identity is the story you tell about the actions that have happened to you. So um, I'm not good enough. So that's why this keeps happening to me Mm. could be the beginning of some kind of identity, but each different person is going to take it in a different way. Some people are going to become really needy and want to cling to people to prove their worth. Some people are going to be a real rebel and go the other way. And so what you do with the story is the identity part. Oh, where you, where you, it sticks on you. It's like, I'm, I need to be tough. And so then you start wearing clothes that look tough and you start becoming really unapproachable to people because you believe no one's going to love you. So you like, I'm going to push them away from me before they push me away. Kind of, if you go back through what identity choices people are making, not that anything's right or wrong, but when you realize why you're making that choice to be like that, then you're free to make any choice rather than your identity choosing for you. That is yeah. fascinating. It is, it's very fascinating. So the, 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 um, so the age period um, is, so womb, as far mm-hmm. back as the womb or even lifetimes before. But yeah. Uh, and then at what point does it kind of shut off where you, when you have a fairly developed belief system? Well, when I was studying psychology back in, it was high school. I didn't do university psychology, but it was, I did grade 11 and 12 psych. And they were telling us that between the ages of zero to 10 is when your neural pathways are formed. And from that point on, you don't make any more neural pathways. So they believed that it was zero to 10. And that's the foundation of what hypnosis and NLP is built on. But since then, scientists have discovered neuroplasty and we are constantly rewiring our brain, creating new neural synapses and all of that sort of thing. So it's, it's possible that you could learn a new behavior after 10 years old, but most of the belief systems about the way life is happen between zero and 10. Mm. Not because that's when the mind is necessarily forming the only neural pathways it's going to get, but because 
in those years, our main function is to find the answer to how is it here and how am I supposed to be here? So we're, we're forming those opinions based on the people we are around, watching our role models, our siblings, our relatives, the people on TV, society, media, like all of that stuff is the child's way of, of learning how to behave. So when they say children don't do what they're told, they do what they see, it's, it's that because that's what's happening in the background. They're looking to, to mimic the life they see around them. And then from about 10 years old onwards, the brain stops doing that. It stops looking to mimic and starts forming more of the identity of now that I think I know everything that there is to know about life, let me decide who I'm going to be in relation to that. And so when we work on stuff, the reason I think we go back to the earliest point, like between zero to 10 or zero to seven, or eight, like the earlier the possible better is because the first seed thought you had that turned into a belief is the place to work. If you work on the beliefs that have been created from a simple thought of, I wonder if this is true, let me go find out, then you're only cutting off the branches of the tree. But if you can go right into that moment that as a kid, you looked around and said, what's going on here? Why don't I feel happy? Maybe it's me. I wonder if that's true. Let me go find evidence for the fact that I'm just not good enough. And that's why these terrible things happen to me. If you can go into that moment where you first went, whoa, maybe it's me, then you can shift that story and it cuts down the tree of belief that you're not good enough. And it goes right into the roots of it. So I think that the brain is a lot more flexible than what like scientists back in the nineties believed and evidence is coming out for that. But the reason it's important to go back to the earliest one and really, I don't think the age matters, but it's just more about the seed event, that moment where you first even questioned why something was the way it was that then created a belief system from there. Mm -hmm. If we can go back to that, then you can rewire, reprogram that code that's operating in the background to see life differently. And that makes a dramatic effect on how you're operating in life and how you're seeing life when you come out of that hypnosis. I, um, I did share this with you. Um, <laughs> I had, when I was in year two, I had this horrifying, terrifying teacher who um, she was just into public humiliation. That was just how it was back then. If you couldn't count. Horrible. Um, she would yell at you if two kids were fighting over something, she'd chop it in half, she'd snap things. She was, she was a very destructive woman from what, what, what my perception was. Uh -huh. um, and I remember very vividly and very clearly, um, and this only came up, oh God, at the end of last year, um, at one point standing up in front of the, the class and she put a blanket over the counting board so I couldn't see the numbers. And I was counting and I got up to about 12. And then after 12, I just got the sweaty palms and she yelled at me and I was standing up by myself in front of the class. And, and as an adult today, like I can look at that and I can go, Oh, uh, I'm, I, I know that I must've made the belief back then that I was dumb and I was stupid and I couldn't mm -hmm. count. And I wasn't any good at maths. And I know that as an adult today, I can look back on that and I can, I, I understand that my perception because I have done personal growth, I understand my perception at that time might be different. And I know that I'm not dumb and I'm not stupid, although that sometimes that narrative can take over. Yeah. So why is it if I'm an adult and I can look at that event clearly and understand, well, that's how it was. Mm -hmm. Why is that not, why is that not enough? Why does hypnotherapy have to happen in order for me to go back and do that properly? Even though I, was rash, I can be rational now, mm -hmm. but still it's this irrational fear response that I go into when I'm put on the spot to count. It's because it's happening in your unconscious mind, not your conscious mind. Mm. So it's, it's just happening in a different part of your mind that hypnosis puts you into that part of your mind. So it's like going into the, the programs. You can't do it thinking consciously. Mm -hmm. It's, it has to be rewired while you're in the state that the programming is in. 
Mm. So trance is like a light meditation all the way into a deep trance, depending on what the hypnotherapist does. I like a light trance where people are aware of what they're saying, but can still access their unconscious mind. So that that part of you that knows, okay, that was just the perspective of that child self in that moment. And it's understandable. You felt like that. And it doesn't mean there was anything wrong with you in that moment. And so you can use your wisdom that you've gained as an adult to actually soothe the child self Mm -hmm. and get her to see that she's amazing and be there for her. And say like, you're there for yourself. You've got your own back. You, You can do all these amazing things that you wished an adult had done for you in that moment. And that's what I find really beneficial is getting people into that light trance where you're in that unconscious mind, but you're not unconscious. And so I guess that's the difference that some people think that being in your unconscious mind means being out, like being asleep. And it doesn't. You go into an unconscious trance when you're watching television. Television is... Really? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if you ever watch something and then just like suddenly, you know, you know, your hands moving, you're eating, but you're sort of not really aware of it or like time goes by much more quickly and stuff like that mm. it's because you enter into an alternate state of, of consciousness, basically into more of an unconscious trance, which is why television ads work so well because they've got you in that trance state already. So then they're just infiltrating your mind pretty much everything is hypnosis. Everything that you've been told repeatedly that you believe is you being hypnotized to believe something, even your name. Your name was something somebody made up once and then repeated that to you enough that you believed it was true. And so now you believe you're Yana, but you could be anything. But we create these like rules about who we are and then that defines us and that becomes our identity. And then when we really look at it and think, that was just something somebody told me. Yeah. I, exactly. I just believe it's true. Wow. And when you look at life like that, there is a lot of things that we are being told are true right now that aren't necessarily. Mm. And if as a society, we, we were aware of our own process and how easily we hypnotize, we would be way less susceptible to the type of propaganda brainwashing that is happening in the media. Mm. And we would be able to distinguish truth from fiction because of the way we feel inside about it. Some things just don't add up, but because they're telling us repeatedly and we're listening to the authority figures and we're thinking that must be true, they wouldn't hurt us. But it's all tied into the child self, the child never really um, separating their sense or need of validation from the adult, the caregiver, the authority figure. And constantly looking for how am I, am I okay from outside sources rather than from that deep knowing inside you that you are okay and you're more than okay. You're fucking fantastic. <laughs> like, <laughs> sorry, I get really passionate. About you know, it. that's good. Is it, okay. Um, do people get to a certain point in life where, it, 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 where they start naturally questioning, uh, you know what, Fuck, this isn't sitting with me right anymore or or do they get it to a natural state of, 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 of being so uncomfortable or, and then wanting to reach out and do something about it? Is that common? Mm. Yeah, unfortunately, the people, by the time they reach me, they're so uncomfortable that they don't see any other option. It's kind of like I'm the last resort. Which wow. is <laughs> like, I look at my business model and I'm like, I don't really believe in problems. I think it's all mindset stuff, but I seem to have a lot of people come to me with these problems and then I have to like really listen to their problems and, and take on their problems for them for that moment of, yeah, okay, I understand that you think you have a problem, but let's go and actually find out what this really is. Mm. And so by the time people leave me, it's completely changed their life. Um, and I, I often laugh about how I've created this business model where I, I help people not need me. And I hate that people need me in the first place, but yeah, like I think a lot of people. It's so backwards, isn't it? it, It's so backwards. (laughs) (laughs) I think a lot of people think they need somebody from outside of themselves. The truth is everybody is amazing inside. We all have the power to do what I've done for myself over my lifetime. I didn't have a me except I had me. So like I had my own back after a certain point when I realized that the way I speak to myself is, is really dramatically affecting the life that Mm. I'm living. Um, 
So I think everybody has the power to transform themselves inside themselves already. But hypnosis is a way of shortcutting the amount of time that takes and really getting to the crux of it in a uh, focused way rather than a lots of persistence and consistency type of way, which is what if, it, if you want to transform your unconscious mind, you can do it, but it takes consistent daily minute by minute action of listening to your thoughts and being really responsible for repeating to yourself something that you prefer to think rather than the thing your unconscious mind is sending to your conscious mind. Mm. So it's harder work doing it that way. It took me many, many years, like 20 years or something to do it that way. But you know, in, in the space of six months, somebody can completely transform their life with a few hypno sessions. So it's, it's one of those things that I wish people would do it before they really hit rock bottom. But I think for a lot of people that getting to the most uncomfortable place they've ever been is actually a great motivator. Mm. And so I don't begrudge that. I, I've done that so many times in my life where I, I knew that I needed to leave a situation, but I was really wanting it to work. So I let myself get to the point where I was so uncomfortable. I was in depression. I was really not coping before I said, Kelly, you need to be the one who loves yourself. Nobody else is going to come in and ride in on a white horse and save you right now. Like this has to be you. And so I wish people would come to me before that. I wish it was a preventative thing rather than a, a, you know, a fixing thing. But at any point when people want to transform their life, whatever stage they're at, I think that's amazing. And I applaud that. And yeah, so wherever you're at, I think it's, it's always going to help you, even if you're at the top of your game, to be able to get into a zone where you can manifest things almost instantly. So that was my next question is like, do you need to have, do you, first of all, do you need to have a problem and B, do you need to know what the problem is? Do you need to have a conscious understanding? It's like, I think I, this is the problem or, or I, I guess my thing is if you were to go into the mind and then do you know what you're looking for or is it? Yeah. It comes back to the, the action thing you asked about before of who you're being. I don't need to know the story behind the problem. I just need to know how you're feeling about it mm -hmm. because if you, I know how you're feeling about it and you can identify that feeling, then we can go back to, and I always do this anyway. We always follow the feeling to wherever the unconscious mind has um, seeded that thought. So your neural pathways are kind of like a roadmap and the feelings or they're a road and the feelings are the map. So when you feel a certain feeling, what's happening is your neurology is lighting up as if that very first thing is happening again. And your unconscious mind doesn't know the difference between real or imagined. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine your best life, your neural pathways go, okay, we're in our best life and we're feeling great and amazing. But most people spend their power of their mind imagining the worst possible scenarios and outcomes based on what they think is real, which is just what's happened to them in the past. And so they're investing all of their energy in that. So they manifest it where attention goes, energy flows. So if you, it's that fable of the two wolves on your shoulders, which one do you feed the angry wolf or the happy wolf, whichever one you feed is the one that thrives. And so it's, it's, I think the first point is to get to the realization that you have control over what your mind looks like, the interior of your mind, whether it's a jungle or whether it's an oasis. And when you realize that you start looking for ways that you can um, interact with it in a way that gets you the best outcome, rather than thinking that's all there is, I can't do anything about it, I'm stuck with this. And I'm not sure if I'm answering your question anymore. I think I'm no, going no, off no, into no, another keep going, keep going, keep going. <laughs> keep going. No, it's great. I'm hanging off every word. Yeah. So what you do with your mind is up to you mm. where therapy hypnosis or whatever. And I'm going to rephrase that. I think just talk therapy can be um, problematic in the way that you're going over and over and over the story, which is running the path of that neural pathway over and over and over again, which means it's deepening the groove of that being real. 
so to, that strong girl. yeah so to overcome something that you've been telling yourself a story about for a really long time is not harder but if you were to do it in your everyday life it would be harder because you've got to retell a story that it doesn't have a groove yet mm. so hypnosis is like going in and okay seeing the feeling following the deep groove that's been created all the way back to the original moment where that feeling was created and then deciding what's the new groove I'm going to create or like river so that now when the thoughts flow, they flow down this one. And so we do that by you consciously deciding who do I choose to be? How do I choose to feel every day? What decision in this moment is going to create the, the feeling of empowered, grateful, self-assured, all of that. And so you're basically connecting new neural pathways that create a new riverbed that then over time after the hypnosis becomes deeper and deeper and deeper because that's the new story you're telling yourself. So when we come across something that we think is just real, it's true, it's that part of our identity, it's who we are, it's how life is. I'm doing all of that in inverted commas because they're all just stories we tell ourselves. <laughs> I can't count. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I do that. Yeah, I'm just it. not good at math. Yeah. I'm a creative. It's yeah. just not how I'm wired. Well, well it you isn't can still be a creative. <laughs> you can be creative and be creative at spelling and creative at maths. You're just creative exactly. in that too. Um, it was my, uh, my developer said that to me once. He said, um, you know, people don't think that developers are creative, but in fact, we are yeah. very creative. They're probably some of the most creative people that you could come across and they use, yeah. you know, coding in order to be able to do that. It's amazing so to be able to take something that doesn't look like anything and know that it's turning into something that looks great. Yeah. Like that's, that takes good brain stuff. Yeah. <laughs> we all have good brain stuff. We do. I want, to have, I want to chat about, okay, so we just talked about that groove of going mm -hmm. down a neural pathway uh, into the past where we've got this, and I, and I love that analogy that well, what you was the analogy it was the truth of going and going over stories mm -hmm. and I guess the traditional method of, of um of therapy which has its place i absolutely you know, um but i understand that group you, that i can see that um but as far as okay so uh, you said that you, you can be as you top of your game and you could be manifesting something mm -hmm. is manifesting this is a similar sort of like creating a new groove this way or what is manifesting but talk to me about that yeah uh we are always manifesting we are manifestation machines we've just been lied to about the fact that we are and so when you realize that actually everything that you have in your life has come from something you've chosen, it really shocks you to start with because you start looking around and going, well, this is me anyway. I didn't like what I saw in my life. So I'm like, I don't want to take responsibility for creating all this shit. But when I did and I started to listen to the thoughts in my own head and realize how much of a piece of shit I was talking to myself as you know, like I was calling myself that I was calling myself stupid, like swearing at myself inside my head all the time. Mm -hmm. It was no wonder that the stuff outside of me reflected back to me that belief. So manifesting was happening from that groove, that strong groove of, I wasn't good enough. And so I had to start replacing those thoughts with better thoughts, the things I wanted to be. So manifesting when you want to change is a different question to what is manifesting. So I'll answer both. We are always sending out energy. Quantum physics has been able to isolate different energy fields within our body that are directly affecting the quantum field that is around us at all times. And in the quantum field, everything exists in possibility and probability. Infinite probability exists in the quantum field. The only thing that affects that probability is our conscious awareness and where it's focused. So when we are consciously aware of something, we bring it out of the probability field and into the reality field. So when we're focused on the probability of life being shit, we bring that into reality and life's shit. When we focus on the probability of life being incredibly amazing and all of our dreams coming true, we reach in and we grab that and bring that out. So it's whatever you're holding and they're found, what you're holding in your heart is responsible for what sends out into that field. 
So they've found a torus field that is emanating from our heart, like a big donut that comes up out the top and around and back through the center, but it's three dimensional. So it's a big donut that goes around our hearts and the edges of that field are undetectable. They have machines that can, or testing what equipment that can measure it up to eight meters from our body, but they believe it goes infinitely. They just don't have the tests to measure it past eight meters. And so what, the function, uh, the function of that energy in our heart is to send a message into the quantum field to say, bring me this. When you're feeling hurt. Far out, we're powerful. We Sorry. are so powerful. Ah, that's like, wow, ah, I've got that? Yeah, you've got that. And you would have seen the, the change in your life when your heart was calling one thing in versus another. Like whenever you've had a real change of heart in something, and you start emanating the new feeling. And this is why when you said is being an action, it absolutely is because we, we think a thought, but when we feel the emotion of it and we hold that vibration in our heart, it literally sends it into the quantum field through this Taurus field in our hearts. And so the trick with manifesting is to look around and see your life all messed up and visualize it perfect if you can do that, you can transform it. If you look at what's outside of you and believe wholeheartedly that that's real and you can do nothing about it, well, guess what? You're right. That's true because you will never change your mind in a way that allows you to send a different energy from your heart. When you start thinking, I don't like what I see now, but that's not what I'm stuck with. I'm going to start visualizing because remember the unconscious mind doesn't know the difference between real or imagined. If you start visualizing, imagining the best life and how would you feel? Imagine all of your dreams come true. Just do this with me now. Everyone listening, imagine your dreams coming true. Everything you wanted is right here for you. Feel that inside you. Like what happens inside you? Like my chest starts to like explode with joy. Yeah. If you feel that joy, you're like, oh, I'm so joyful. Everything's coming. That's amazing. And I look around and I have the best people and I have the, the best opportunities. And I'm so abundant because everything I need just appears for me as I need it. It's not about money. It's about just having whatever resource I need available to me because my heart believes it so much and trusts so much that the universe will just provide that for me. That I can feel so grateful and happy and send that out. And I started there. Not because my life showed me that that was reality, but because I inside decided to take responsibility for what would my reality look like. And that was a few years ago. I started on that track. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I went from living in a van because we decided that if we're going to get rid of our emotional stuff, why not see what life's like if you can get rid of your physical stuff as well? So my partner and I, actually were given a motorhome after putting that on a vision board. The very next day, a friend gave us a van to remodel for free. And then we traveled around Australia. We went across to Perth and back and we didn't know how we were going to manage that. But I, I scheduled in meditation ceremonies along the way. I just fully trusted that all of the money would come to travel all the way across and back four months of, of amazing adventures and then we didn't want to leave the van when we got back to the Gold Coast because it was so nice to not have things, stuff, just like this stuff that we carry around. And then when all of the lockdowns happened, it wasn't possible to live in a van anymore. You know, the gym shut down. We didn't have access to showers and things like that. So moving into a place, we then realized we needed two cars. So I started to think, oh, I'm going to need to buy a car that's going to need me to budget. Like there's a lot of stress there. And I caught myself in that moment oh. and I sort of gave myself a bit of a slap across the face. I'm like, Kelly, what are you doing? You're a powerful creature who can manifest. You are a creator. What would you choose? If you could choose, what's the reality you would choose? And I said, well, I choose somebody to give me a car for free. And the other part of my brain's going, who's going to do that? And then the bigger me is just saying, I don't know because I don't need to know how something's going to happen in order for it to happen. So universe, I'd like a free car, please. The very next day, a friend gave Guy a free car. No. Yep. 
And then he started a job. You're like a, a car, car manifestator. You you can start a car yard called <laughs> Manifest. I got this. Manifest for free. Motors. <laughs> Good one. The whole new career. (laughs) The belief in myself that I can create an opportunity where things come to me and getting rid of the need to know how, getting rid of the stipulation on it, it can only come to me through this way, has freed me so much. Like money, for example, we think we need money in order to be happy, in order to have nice things, in order for all of that. I really got to a point in my life where I questioned everything about my identity so much that I started questioning everything about these laws that they say are real. Like you need to have a certain amount of money in your bank to have a car or something like, Oh, I just manifested one out of thin air. So what else can I create? And what other resources are just there for me without me needing to struggle to find them? And the moment I sat back, I feel that feeling in my heart and I let it go everything just comes at the right time in the right way from the right people. I just need to be open to it and open to receiving it. Otherwise I would block it when it came. And I think a lot of people are doing this. I think a lot of people are wishing really hard that they could have a better life, better things in their life, all the rest of it, but they're so closed to receiving it or they've shut off 20 options and they're only allowing one option to be open. Like I have to be able to afford it from my bank account before something can arrive in my life. And so you're actually preventing the universe from that quantum field, from flowing that thing that your heart is calling in to you. You're like, no, 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 no. I really want this, but no, 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 no. So yeah, I work with people a lot on opening to receive actually. That's a big part of it. It's a big one. Yeah. And oh, I had a question, but I got, then I just lost it. Damn. <laughs> and it wasn't even on my list. It was kind of the next, oh, oh worrying. Mm. So you just mentioned worrying and like. That's a big one. How much are you, what is worrying and what is having a, a uh, being realistic about, I don't know what is real anymore. I don't know. Uh-huh. Kind of what is real? What is real? Exactly. And where does worry, you know, what does worry do to us? Okay. Again, it blocks us from receiving. Mm-hmm. It um, does, but it also manifests the thing that you're worrying about right. where attention goes, energy flows. Mm. The thing you focus on the most is the thing that you call in from the quantum field. Mm. So I used to be a big warrior. It's still something I need to manage in my mind every day because I overthink and I can see so many different potentials happening that I start to worry about those negative potentials. And so I think I've got to put all of these things into place to stop that negative potential from coming true. And then when I realized that my focus on the fact that that negative potential was possible was what would be allowing it to be created in the first place, that was a big responsibility. (laughs) yeah so worrying they say is a form of prayer and for me yeah because like whatever you're so I'm not religious so Mm. when I heard that I was like what is prayer I'm not going to sit down and ask God for my worries prayer is manifest it's manifesting isn't it exactly prayer is when you think of something focused put your energy into it and you, you really call it in And so when you're worrying heaps, you're doing that exact same process. I think we need to take a step back from the words and look at the process. Think about something a lot, put a lot of emotion and energy behind it. It manifests in reality. Think about a good thing a lot, put a lot of good energy into it. It manifests in reality. Think about a bad thing a lot. Sorry, microphone. Put a lot of bad energy into that. It manifests in the world. So the thing you're thinking about is not as important as the mechanism that like the process you're going through. If you can take responsibility, then you're taking responsibility for the process and understanding that it's like a code that you do one thing, you do the next thing, you get the result. Um, There's probably a lot of other steps before this thing, you know, like clearing a lot of your baggage and your identity structures and the limiting beliefs and all of that sort of stuff. When you then, um, because who you are being 
when you think this positive thought, if you're coming from lack, if you're coming from, well, I'm a victim and like, I really want this to be true because I'm trying to overcome all the things that are wrong in my life. So you're giving more power to the things that are wrong in your life because you're trying to fight against them. So there's a lot involved in stepping into a space where you're whole, complete and perfect and then manifesting from there will create the best result rather than trying to manifest against something, if that mm. makes sense. Mm. So it's, it's simplified the way I'm explaining it, but it's, there's a lot of steps to do. Um, but when you can do them and just be conscious of the thoughts in your mind and willing to see what is reality then it gets easier. And can you remind me of what your question was? Because I no, 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 no. <laughs> um, oh, we went down some of the, uh, the... What is was, prayer? Uh, prayer, what is prayer, worry? prayer, prayer. Worry, it was worry and prayer. And you know what? That makes absolute sense. Because it yeah. does, it makes, it makes sense. And I do come from a religious background. I was taken to church every weekend. And I look yeah. at that now and I think, wow. You know, anyway, we won't get into a religious debate um, on this. But yes, I what you were saying is just makes absolute absolute sense of of rep, that repetition and, yeah. and saying something in that deep for sure yeah. and you know i think there's a lot of value in what different religions are teaching and there's a lot of truths in there but there is also a lot of mistruths <laughs> um where they've taken um i think the one reason i don't identify as religious and identify as spiritual is that in religion, I see that the power is in a source outside of you. And in my knowing, the, the power is within me. I am everything. Everything is me as above, so below, as within, so without the macrocosm, microcosm. Mm. And so when I see myself as separate from the energy outside of me, then it's very difficult for me to think I have any influence over that. Mm. And I think it has influence over me because the power is outside, right? So when we're coming from that mentality, it's we have to first break through that mentality and into a, oh, the power's within me. The power's within me. Wow. I'm sending it out, not the other way around. Just that. That's huge. Huge. Because I guess if, you're, if you've been going to church, like, okay, for example, okay, we're talking about it now. You go to church every yeah. weekend as a child growing up, and that yeah. that belief, even even if I don't believe all of the stories or anything like that, but just that belief that mm -hmm. there is a power outside of yep. of me. Yeah, that's that that's huge. It's huge, and it's one of the ways that society controls us <laughs> is. <laughs> to make you believe that knowledge is in books, knowledge is in the teachers, knowledge is outside of you. But what do you think your intuition is, your inner tutor, the one within you that has the knowledge, right? So spirituality and the way our society is constructed have some very counter views about what reality is and where your power lies and society and government and religions and all of that benefit from you thinking that your power is outside of you or that you have none and that they have it all and spirituality benefits from you understanding that it comes from within you mm. and so I'm not here to say what's right or wrong I'm more about the fact of what feels best to you actually if you knew that the only person's opinion that mattered of what choice you make is yours and you took that responsibility in life, you can create a life that is magical for you. And it might look so different to mine. And that's cool. Like it doesn't have to look the same as somebody else's. It shouldn't. It should look like your life. And I think this is really where we're missing education in our society and in just everything is that giving people the power to choose for themselves means people understanding truly what their feelings are, who they really are, who they choose to be. And when we spend so long shoving down bad emotions because we don't want to remember our past, we, we shove down all emotions. And mm -hmm. so we become very um, numbed to what do we really feel? What do we really want? And then it's easy to be manipulated by other people. It's easy to get into narcissistic relationships. It's easy to feel like you're putting yourself aside all of the time and that you don't have good boundaries. And a lot of these problems stem from a 
simply people not knowing themselves. So the reason I called myself Authentic Self-Alignment with Kelly Vanier (laughs) is because I realized that the crux of everything was when people are aligned to the truth of who they are, when they stop looking at external sources for validation, they get to see life in a way that creates no problems. Now, humans are humans. We will always have problems, but I don't think people think having um, too many options, like uh, we could cho- choose too many houses because now we're financially a- abundant or now there's too many good men to choose from or women to choose from, or there's like too many good jobs to choose from. Like they're still problems, but they're much better quality problems than the, <laughs> nobody loves me. I can't even afford rent. Like I can't find a good job, you know? Yeah. So humans will always have problems, but the also there are no problems. It's just the way we look at the thing. And sometimes our biggest adversities are our biggest blessings. Mm. And when you can open yourself to receive the blessing of a door slamming in your face, metaphorically, whether that's a relationship breaking up, a job not working, like your car breaking down, whatever it is, if you can embrace that as a as a redirection into a better path rather than a a sign that something's wrong, then you can start to get into the flow and start looking for the opportunities that are all around you all the time, instead of seeing the, the limitations that most people are currently focused on. Talk to me about receiving. Receiving. Talk Talk to me. So, I think a lot of people think that they're good people by being givers and we've been kind of told be a giver, don't be a taker. Right. So there's this social belief and kind of social etiquette that it's better to give than it is to receive. But at what point do you run out of stuff to give if you're never receiving? A lot of people say you've got to give first and in sales, I think that's true because there's these laws of reciprocity and I think it's good for your clients to understand that you're caring and it's about them. And so giving them doesn't have to be like stuff for free necessarily. It could be attention. It could be love. It could be um, understanding. It could be like your energy. Like there's lots of things that we can give first to show a person that we're safe, that we're trustworthy, you know, hopefully you are all of those things. And then you know, that's why you're able to feel that, <laughs> not just manipulating people. Um, and so the, the receiving part happens for yourself behind the scenes. The work that you do needs to happen outside of your client experiences especially like if you're in a business, you shouldn't be like doing the work of learning to love yourself through being validated by your clients. Mm. You should be doing that behind closed doors so that when you walk into your studio and you're, you're there, it's showtime, you are ready to give. But where are you receiving yourself? Where are you receiving the belief that you're good enough, the belief that um, you're abundant? Where are you receiving all of that? outside of those moments you've got to receive that first you've got to be able to receive a compliment Mm. like how hard is it to just say thank you when someone says that's a really nice dress oh no no i just got this from target oh like just say thank you (laughs) i used to i used to do that all the time i'm like oh this piece of shit oh this this whole thing i've had it for five years exactly you say oh it's got pockets yeah thank you it's got pockets That's way better. (laughs) Exactly. It's okay to then compliment them back. But if you put up a big no to a compliment, what do you think you're doing when the universe goes, here's that thing you've been asking for. Oh, no, I'm not good enough to receive that. But you've been asking for it. Oh, come here, puss off. Come here, piss off. Yeah. And all of that comes down to our belief about ourselves. How common is this? This is common. This is obviously very common because you're doing a a whole workshop on it. Yeah, it's so common. Far out. Yeah, so I'm doing a 21-day challenge coming up in August. Um, So it's a free challenge for everybody to get involved, to open up to receive more. It's 
something that I think people just need practice in. It helped Mm. me. It was probably one of the main activities that helped me get to where I am was learning to say thank you. (laughs) And is it, is now, is this part of, so this, this receiving thing, is this part of manifestation? It is. It is. It's a really key component. Okay. Because you can't, how can you manifest if you're not open to receive the outcome of your manifestations? Mm. So a lot of times we, we ask for good things and it comes to us in a form we're not expecting. So we put up a hand and say, no, not like that. Mm. Okay. And that limits us. So we are in an infinite universe. We have limited minds. Our consciousness is limited we're not fully expanded to the point where we can see everything. It would confuse us too much. We'd probably all look like we were mental patients. (laughs) We would blow up. (laughs) We would. I have a lot of friends who are are waking up and seeing into the other dimensions of reality that are all around us. And for moments when they first start waking up, they believe they have like schizophrenia or bipolar because society tells you if you're seeing things that aren't there, then there's something wrong with you. But actually Mm. they're seeing energy that is there. Mm. They're seeing the connections between people. They're able to manipulate the energy in your body and heal certain parts of you that that Western science wouldn't have a choice with. They're they're able to to do so many things on a quantum level. And it's so exciting for me when I meet these people, I'm like, ah, and they're like, oh, I thought I was crazy. And I'm like, no, this is amazing. (laughs) And even though I don't have those skills, I'm able to help them foster their skills because I believe in it so much and they start believing in themselves. And the results speak for themselves. Like they take things that are uh, in their mind and, and turn them into tangibilities, like things that I can physically interact with. And so... Um, there is so much going on that we can't see. And so for us to ask for something to come to us in a particular way, like say, for instance, you wanted a new car, like I did, if I'd said, I want a red car, that's a convertible, well, that would have been a lot harder for the universe to give me the following day. Mm. But I said a car, a free one that like how it came to me and who from and all of the rest of it wasn't so much of a concern for me. So we put limitations on our manifestations, the more specific we get. And I know there's a lot of teaching out there about be really specific about what you want to manifest. The only thing I think we should be specific about is the feeling we hold in our heart. If that thing was already in our lives, because if you are manifesting from the feeling you get from something, the perfect thing is going to like show up for you if the feeling in your heart is what you feel when the perfect thing is in front of you. Right. Mm. So you might not even know what's perfect for you in the six months future point that it takes for that thing to manifest into your life. So if you're really specific about a thing that you're manifesting based on who you are today, you might have so much growth between now and when the thing actually turns up that it doesn't look great to you. It doesn't matter anymore. Wow. I only had that the other day. Isn't that. Did it happen? Yeah. Oh my God. You just said that. I was like, there you go. That is so true. Wow. So we manifest from who we are and we, we are a different person every moment. Like everyone listening to this is now a different version of themselves because they've heard this stuff. And so 21 days, what sort of a, like why 21 days? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you have another part? No, no. (laughs) Why 21 days and, and yes. And and the other part was, yes. How can we, how can we get in touch and and, and do this? So 21 days, because it takes 21 days for the cells in your body to reform the receptors, to start responding to different chemical responses from your brain. Mm. So we have receptors in our cells that feed off the chemical, chemicals that uh, our brain emits Emotions are just chemicals that pass through our nervous system on a physiological level, just, you know, to us, they're way more than that. (laughs) But if we're thinking of them from that perspective, so it takes 21 days to form a new habit physically in your body. Uh, There's a really good movie, if anyone's interested in this, called What the Bleep Do We Know? Mm -hmm. And it's about an hour long quantum physics movie. And it explains how we have these kind of, almost monsters in our body craving 
the emotion. Like if you're always the victim or people are always taking advantage of you or you're just always causing fights with people or nobody ever understands you. Like if that is part of your identity, what happens is the cells in your body open up receptors to feed on the chemical that is produced when you feel misunderstood or angry or the victim or whatever. And so what they do is they actually, cause you, they want that feeling. They ask for that feeling. So they're like creating these things in the world around you so that they continue to be fed. Mm. So when we, Taking responsibility is also understanding that we need 21 days to completely change those cells. Like I'd go 30 days. I'd rather go longer. Like I do a six month thing. Maybe that's something I can flow onto if people are loving the thing and they want to keep doing more because 21 days is the minimum that I would ever try and like reach shape something in my life. If I, notice the process over those 21 days i feel like you know have you ever tried to quit sugar mm. man like the cravings and like it's fully like these monsters are in your mind like eat the sugar just go on it's okay like, <laughs> stop it and it's that that process of those things dying off um so when our ego starts to be seen and held in the light it really kicks up a fuss when our cravings start to realize that they're on the way out, they really kick up a fuss and try and claw back into you by making you feel really terrible. But if we understand that as part of the process of the old self dying and it, we need to move through that, then we can get to the good stuff on the other side. And I think doing it in a group, doing it in a challenge is one of the ways that we motivate ourselves. So yeah, that's why I did 21 days. Excellent. And so um, is there a support of people? Are we doing it together as a team or are we doing this solo? Yeah, together. So I've got a group in Facebook called Rising Consciousness Collective. So we're going to do it inside there. And there's a sign up on my website, which is kellyvanier.com forward slash 21 day challenge. Yep. And so sign up for that. And there's going to be meditations. There's going to be affirmations and there's going to be journal writing. So not heaps of writing, but just, you know, basically writing down your affirmations in a way or kind of looking for what you're grateful for and doing all of that sort of stuff. They're simple, easy steps, but we do them consistently over the period of time. We get our mind focused on what we can create when we're focused on the good stuff, when we're open to receive. It's practices like saying thank you to a compliment and just pausing. Oh! <laughs> I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm signing up. Yes. Yes. And this is completely free. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. A total yeah. free one. Lovely. So everyone can join in. And, and what day, what day are we starting? Uh, 11th of August. 11th of August. I'm in. This is so exciting. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get a crew of people together. Yeah. Cause I love that idea. I love it. I love it. I was just like, yeah, what you, what can you do in 21 days? Um, it's so cool. Manifest something. Why not? Yeah. And you know, I think we all can benefit from holding that vision of who we choose ourselves to be at some future point. And it does take a lot of trust and faith to keep holding that when everything outside of you looks like it's turning to shit or falling apart. Mm. If you can do that, you'll get the rewards. I was not somebody who was born with this mentality. I, my mum said my first words were, I can't. I may have been saying something else to her, but she said that I was just like, no, I can't do that. I can't do this. I was just so down on myself and I was labeled as pessimistic and I didn't know what anxiety was back then, but I had full blown panic attacks at the doctors once and had to go on Valium and all the rest of it because I was so out of touch with my truth with the understanding of who I was and why I felt what I felt and even that I could do anything about it. And when I discovered that I had the choice, that I had the power inside me, that was the best day of my life. And it was hard work because yeah, everything around me didn't look great. And I had to look at that and visualize the best possible scenario at the same time. And that's when it's the toughest, but it gets easier and easier and it's kind of like a roller coaster, you know, like it goes up and down because we go through cycles of development 
And every time kind of like these layers of the onion, we go around in circles and sometimes we get to the same point, but we're in a deeper layer. And so it looks like we're back to the start, but we're not, we're going in, we're like, we're getting through it. And so it's not an easy journey to do on your own, which is why I created the Facebook group. It's a free group. It's just come in. I do lives. I do meditations. I post articles that have helped, you know, things that I'm writing about that have helped me in my life. And it's just a great little place. If you've got an upbeat spirit, if you're looking for different ways to view life that aren't out there in the mainstream media and that aren't so common in society, then, you know, it's a place where people can come. It might not resonate with everybody, but if it resonates with you and you feel like you want a bit more of a spiritual slash quantum physics slash Kelly's perspective on life, then it's a great place to be. <laughs> I, I, and I'm looking forward to it. I will, and I will bring a crew with me. Nice. Thank you so much for your time, Kelly. My um, pleasure. I will share um, all of these links in the blog um, below Perfect. this video as well and in the YouTube channel as well. So I really appreciate your time. Thank um, you so much for interviewing me. It was so I much love fun. It. <laughs> I can talk all day. I could do yeah, one of these too. a week. I could just do the one a week. I could do we one. We could. Week. Like, totally. I don't even think even after a year we would have anything to stop talking about it. With the yeah, for sure. yeah, for sure. For sure. Thank you so much. Thanks, I honey. appreciate it. You have a Thanks wonderful week. You do. Thank I'll you. see you again soon. See ya. Bye. Bye.